The German tale of Faust is one of the most significant in helping us understand the world we live in today. Faust, a scholar, is unsatisfied with his achievements. His search for knowledge had thus far proven fruitless. All his life work, his mastery of human knowledge is futile. He summons the demon Mephistopheles, with whom he trades his soul for earthly fulfillment. He gains all the power, wealth, fame, and knowledge of the world in payment for eternal damnation. This is where we get the term Faustian bargain. One where you trade your very soul for knowledge, wealth, power. In legend, many musicians have been accused of trading their souls for worldly acclaim and their musical ability. Like Paganini, Robert Johnson, Bob Dylan. The story is they'd go down to the crossroads to make a deal with the devil. That's when I went to the crossroads and made a, a big deal. You know, like... The crossroads are a symbolic space, a liminal space, where the veil between the worlds is at its weakest. It's also where decisions are made regarding what road one goes down. The choices made here are irreversible. It's clear what road we've chosen to go down. The allure of the internet is obvious. On the surface, it's one of the most miraculous pieces of modern technology. Imagine telling somebody a hundred years ago that anybody could call virtually anybody else on the planet at any given time using a tiny device you can carry in your pocket. You could also use this same device to access all the collected information of all humanity at any time for a fairly inexpensive price. You can access virtually any book written, any film, any song, and these things called games, which are like movies that you can play. This device can connect you to jobs, communities, events, basically anything you could dream of or anything you could have nightmares about. The internet was a Faustian bargain and had such obvious material benefits, knowledge, pleasure, entertainment, any earthly aspiration you could imagine. But it's had untold effects we are still reeling from now. Many effects which I think will remain hidden until decades from now. Many which aren't readily apparent. The internet began, as many destructive technologies did, as a military experiment to distribute packets over a switched network. It was to allow the remote transfer of data. This was basically the stage, starting in 1969, where the technology was being developed. We got file transfer, remote access, email, and such things over the following decades. It was, by its nature, limited, because it was for research and development, government applications. A computer took up a whole room. It required extensive technical knowledge to operate. The modern internet was more of a development, rather than a singular invention. Throughout the 70s and 80s, it opened up to commercial and academic uses. It became broadly publicly accessible in the late 80s through early 90s, but still took decades to penetrate the globe, a process that is still ongoing. It'd still be fair to call even the 90s the early days of the internet, when comparing how things were to how things are now. And in these early days, it was a niche product. The infamous Eternal September occurred in 1993, when ISPs opened the floodgates of Usenet to the unwashed masses, and all previous gatekeeping became impossible to maintain. The cultural standards inevitably declined. The Eternal Summer was called Eternal for a reason. It's still ongoing. Every year it seems bigger and bigger. Naturally, there was a certain kind of person drawn to this early internet. Neckbeards. Hardcore dedicated neckbeards. Before the term even existed, people who loved the machine more than deodorant or hygiene. Early on you used the internet for a very niche purpose. For hobbies that very few people you knew in real life took part in. And it was typically on sites dedicated to that specific niche. And this really included every niche, from tabletop games to fishing to specific genres of music. They were all their own site. You could really find anything, which of course has a downside. It extends to perhaps more unsavory things like obscure pornography or gore. The internet was niche. It was not mainstream. Of course it was still widely available. In first world countries in the 90s through 2000s, it was even marketed towards kids. But it did not creep into every single person's life. A novelty, perhaps. Useful for business but it was still treated with at least a pinch of suspicion. There existed some kind of hesitancy towards buying things online. I mean, things like PayPal were created at least in part to convince the public that online shopping was safe. It was dodgy placing your credit card into random websites. Online dating was for losers. It was considered to be for the socially maladjusted, who couldn't manage it in real life, so they need a screen for protection. Many of these perceptions were extremely common and lasted well into the last decade. There existed in the past a certain ethos among programmers, hackers, engineers, and tech people known as the hacker ethic. 
It has a political dimension, but it was never tied to any specific political movement. It was like an ethical guide to how technology ought to be used, an unspoken agreement. It was a mindset that pushed people above and beyond to do things for the public good. It focused most chiefly on the idea of freedom of information. The 1984 book Hackers by Stephen Levi described this early culture of open and accessible information. Information ought to be shared, free for the good of all. It is from this ethic that we get passion for free and open source software. Although the ethic really started to decline as early as the late 70s into the 80s, where copyright and monopolies started to erode the free and open software environment, some remnant of it remained. Even to today, there are people who sincerely maintain and preserve these same ideas. This is the primordial ooze from which Linux and various open source communities derive. It's the same line of thinking, at the very least, from which free software licenses like GPL and BSD emerged. John Carmack quoted the book for inspiring him to make Doom open source. Richard Stallman, founder of the Free Software Foundation and GNU, stated, The hacker ethic refers to the feelings of right and wrong, to the ethical ideas this community of people had, that knowledge should be shared with the other people who can benefit from it, and that important resources should be utilized rather than wasted. Although as we said the hacker ethics kind of started to die in the late 70s, there was still a similar attitude of rebellion which was default among those on the early internet, at least among the users, perhaps not the corporations running the internet. The people with a voice in these early days maintained the ethic at least with regards to freedom of information. People who thought like this were much more present as a proportion of total internet users when, say, compared to today. Which makes sense given that the internet is ultimately a tool for the propagation of information. The belief that the internet should be an open, dynamic, fast-moving and innovative environment containing literally all information to have ever existed. And that included hosting even the worst elements of humanity. It was about freedom of speech and freedom of information. It was also the belief that sharing this technology with the world would bring people closer together. That learning about others and talking to them directly would destroy prejudice and improve the world. The early internet was the Wild West. This was the era of internet innovation. The dot-com boom occurred because of the novelty of an online-only business. High on the rush of novel technologies, many companies enticed by the minimal overhead and huge new markets started their own web ventures. It was only in 2000 that the bubble burst. This bubble only occurred in the first place because the internet was an exciting new technology and it seemed like you could start an online business in virtually anything. Of course, the bubble bursting brought all of this crashing down, but the web certainly didn't die. In the early internet, there was a website for everything. Every profession had its own dedicated forum, every game, film, subculture. There were many different ways people communicated. Forums, image boards, chat rooms. There were art pieces and online stores for all kinds of things. There was a site for virtually any niche. And it was from this environment that our modern regulations for the internet emerged. It's the backdrop for the creation of modern laws regarding the use of the internet. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act or DMCA was effective beginning in 1998. It described how copyright was to be applied on the internet. Of course this is just an American law but given most global big tech companies are based in America it's something that affects us all. It criminalized the circumventing of DRM and other such copyright related issues. The critics of the DMCA often focus on aspects such as the freedom to use software, how monopolies negatively affect this and how it affects preservation of software. There is also also the issue of fair use, you'll likely have heard complaints surrounding this on YouTube given how common false copyright strikes are on this platform. There was also Section 230, enacted as part of the Communications Decency Act of 1996. The act was ruled unconstitutional in 1997, but Section 230 remains. It's largely regarded as responsible for allowing the internet to exist as it is. Put simply, it made it so that websites were not liable for content posted by their users. It basically defines websites not as publishers of their users' content, but as platforms. Places to host content by other parties, their users. The exact words are as follows. 
No provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. These protections were necessary to foster a fast-moving, innovative business environment. To allow such a level of liability would have stifled competition and it would have made many modern websites, particularly sites like YouTube and social medias, almost completely non-viable. Imagine if YouTube were liable for everything posted on it. Social media sites emerged emerged near the beginning of the new millennium. MySpace was founded in 2003, a place for you to add people as friends. It was focused less on a topic or niche, and more on building a web of social connections. At least, somewhat. It did try to have some music focus going. But this was just a glimpse of what was to come. Facebook was founded in 2004, originally a place to rank the attractiveness of female classmates. It broadened to be a social network, available to university students and eventually the general public. Facebook did not place itself into a box like MySpace did. It recognized that this type of website was about connecting people. It let people use their real names, connect it to their real life persona. This is when you can say the internet started to creep into people's lives. Facebook got ahead specifically because it was tied to the real world. It's where you message your friends, create events, and let others know what you're doing. YouTube was founded in 2005. In the early days, it was limited. Low resolution, videos limited to 10 minutes. Bodies were certainly hitting the floor. The quality of videos was quite poor. Only the most annoying and loud dominated this era. Just imagine what a child would do to irritate his parents. But this era did introduce the idea of going internet viral. There was no money tied to it at this point. But the concept of being viewed by millions of people all around the world at no cost, with no barrier to entry, to broadcast yourself, was alluring. YouTube was acquired by tech giant Google in 2006 and it introduced monetization in 2008. Meaning you could now make money off these viral videos. Imagine being one of the losers who does that for money instead of getting a real job. Twitter released in 2006. Steve Jobs unveiled the iPhone in 2007. It came into being out of his genius ability to tell other people what to do. The Big Bang Theory launched in 2007 and made nerd culture mainstream. Bazinga! What was once obscure was rapidly becoming mainstream. Netflix, a company founded in 1997 to deliver DVDs to people, started its online streaming in 2007. Suddenly a world of entertainment was available to anyone at any time, basically anywhere. Okay, not quite yet, but you could see where it was going. During the decade that would follow, many workplaces went online, meaning the only way to apply was through the internet. You would no longer apply over the phone or in person. The internet became essential to even being employed. Over the 16 years since 2007, the internet has only continued to grow and proliferate. The internet is now in more places in the world than it isn't, at least places where people live. The internet now belongs to the normies. A few large corporations control the vast majority of internet traffic, at least in Western countries. Countries like China and Russia have their own somewhat closed off ecosystems because these countries recognize the importance of all that data not being in the hands of a few American corporations, of not placing the algorithms for content discovery in the hands of these American corporations. The hacker ethic still exists today in some capacity, but it's obscure. The corporations won. Perhaps they won many, many years ago. It's rare for open source projects to be on par with proprietary ones. DRM is more widespread and intrusive than ever. Many games, for example, ask for kernel level access and people just accept it. And they accept it because they have no reason not to. It is only really the people who are into technology, the tech savvy, the folks who proliferated the hacker ethic, who understand the dangers of this level of corporate control over our technology. Millions of internet users do all their internet use from Apple devices, from phones. By design, these devices Devices do not have the user interact with the hardware at anything besides the highest level, the most simplistic. iPhones are intentionally shut off and give as little control as possible to the user. They want you to interact with as little of the machine as possible. This is what makes them user friendly. They work the way they do because of decades of user research. People, at least normal people, do not want to interact with a machine. They want a preset experience, one that is entirely designed and curated for them. I honestly don't know how Apple marketing fucking works. How do people fall for this shit? 
I mean, just look at this manual that compares Mac users to Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi. In the past, there was a baseline level of knowledge you needed to even use a computer. Before Windows was popular, you had to know how to use the command line. Even on Windows, you had to understand how a file system works. I know so many people have already ranted about the articles on young people not understanding how files and folders work, but seriously, Zoomers don't know how file systems work. In university, there's a common assumption that younger generations are tech native, that kids often have to solve their parents' technical problems. The youth have to teach their parents to use technology. It's weird to consider that there might be a world where parents are going to have to answer their kids' annoying, inane technical questions, telling them to turn off their internet and turn it on again. It makes sense that reducing levels of tech savvy among younger generations is going to have negative consequences. People will be less discerning, more likely to give their data to huge corporations in exchange for ease of use. One position I hate regarding this is the defeatists. The people who say, well, they already harvest your data on XYZ services, so why bother with these other security measures? Why do you care about giving this anti-cheat kernel level access on your PC? And yeah, it is hard to not have any of your data online nowadays, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't still resist. Don't give them more data than is necessary. You should still do as much as you can to avoid intrusions on your privacy. Turn off location on your phone when you're not using it. Try to use alternatives to spyware software when you can. Turn off all the spyware settings on your devices. It might mean you have to compromise. You might have to use social media because everybody else is. You need it to talk to friends. But that doesn't mean to give up. That's exactly what they want. This reduction in technical knowledge in an increasingly technologically reliant society is also going to lead to the downfall of civilization. But that's for another time. We gave the normies access to the web where you can say, host, and do anything, and they ruined it in 10 years. We could have access to all the books, games, movies, and shows we could ever want for free, uncensored, and instead we opted for a suite of a million subscription services with a limited range. Censor and remove things so that nobody gets to watch things you don't like. Demand more time-consuming, lower-effort slop from studios to drown out any creativity in the space. When given a device that is so powerful, nerds in the past would have creamed themselves touching it. It's used to take pictures of oneself to share with others for fake internet validation. We gravitate towards the most dull social media sites where innovation is punished and where the content is so short and easily consumable that it's impossible to communicate anything meaningful or worthwhile. High quality work is so often drowned out, it's easy to consume 10 one minute videos to bait you or shock you or affirm your beliefs than it is to consume one 10 minute video that might introduce you to a new idea or make you question what you believe. And that's how far we've fallen because even 10 minutes is really not a long time by any stretch of the imagination. When given all the world's knowledge, we've chosen to create algorithms that only deliver us a fraction of what there is to know. The closer it is to our own experience and perspective, the better. We thought this tech would open people up to new perspectives, instead it's only made the general public more myopic than perhaps ever before in history. Okay, big claim. It only exists to reflect people's egos back at them. That's literally how we engage with the internet. It's an echo chamber, and it's that type of design that drives the most user engagement. The internet has not broadened horizons. We say that to get a proper understanding of something you need to leave the internet and engage with it in the real world. One thing that's been apparent since the flood of the masses onto the internet has been the centralization. There are no longer niche communities. Everything is centered around a few large social media companies who dominate the vast majority of traffic. Reddit has a community for everything. What would have been an independent forum with its own management and admin staff is now a subreddit, subject to the rules of Reddit and its moderation team. It's all centralized. All of these communities are under the whim of some of the most pathetic people in our society. Reddit mods. Where you have to abide by a stupid list of arbitrary rules made by a fat loser to take part in a community. Everything is also tied to a persona. A social credit system. Why did this happen? This centralization? Perhaps it's some psychological thing. Perhaps it just feels easier to stay on the same site than it does to go between a bunch of sites to discuss different topics. That plus it's consistent. It's easier to navigate a different subreddit because it's basically the exact same layout. All video content is consumed through YouTube or TikTok. Alt tech is making a valiant effort, but people are going to go where the audience is. These sites are entrenched. 
Google owns search results. You could search for something elsewhere, but you're meant to Google it. I mean, Twitter owns its own thing, basically short form rage bait posts, mental garbage, essentially. I'm sorry, but nobody's going to go to your Mastodon. Nobody cares about your honey or hive or tribal or blue sky or any of that shit. No one's going to follow you on there. Big tech is entrenched. It's settled. They're too big to fail. Nobody's going to come along and disrupt it. People look back at MySpace as an example of a social media falling off hugely. But I highly doubt that's going to happen again. Not with the current market leaders. Things have changed far too much. Given the current market and environment, any innovation that significantly overturns big tech is highly unlikely. It's hard for new companies to go up against the giants. It's virtually impossible, no matter how competitive they are. The major websites of the internet collectively act as a kind of corpus, a whole body of its own. Without any part of the body, its proper function is disrupted. Ideas are filtered from Twitter to Instagram to Facebook before being excreted at Reddit. The culture, the memes, the terminology all go through a life cycle, and each station is an essential part of this life cycle. Sites like 4chan are controversial, but 4chan has survived so many attempts to de-platform it, delist it, wipe it clean from the internet because of the disgusting things you can see by just opening up the site. And that's because 4chan is an essential organ of the internet. So much of the language, memes, culture and iconography of the internet originates there. It's the spawning ground for all the culture that is then filtered through the rest of the internet, sanitized, made fit for consumption by the masses. As entirely cringeworthy as it is to say, 4chan is like the shadow, or the repressed id of the collective unconscious of the internet. The thing you hate acknowledging but can't get enough of, that you start to absorb and project. I think top dogs in big tech implicitly understand this at some level. They exist in an ecosystem, and though they would never publicly admit such a thing and can plausibly deny any connection to the site, they recognize that they stand to benefit from its existence. And it's why, despite there being several campaigns over the years to take the site down, as happens with any controversial site, there has never been a decisive move to strike the website from the internet. And yes, if there is a body analogy of the internet, Reddit is most certainly the anus. There is also the fact that any social media is equally, if not more, guilty in hosting illegal, violent, racist, exploitative and extreme content. It's just that the algorithm masks all that from the average user. It creates the echo chamber, where the average user is never or rarely exposed to the unsavory things their fellow users share. The first page of 4chan is like if you could read the mind of everyone on a train carriage as soon as you walk on it. In a very simplified way, content on regular social media is promoted to the user based on their interests. On 4chan, content is promoted purely based on the reactions it gets, the replies to the thread. This means that the content you see is purely what generates the most reactions, positive or negative. And it also isn't even remotely true that the website is some kind of free speech haven or unmoderated. Content is removed off the site all the time by its moderators. Control of the web is centralized. Web services are dominated by three companies, realistically two. In the past, most companies would host their own web services on their own web servers. But then big tech companies thought the cloud would be a brilliant idea. And it was, it made them a lot of money. It allows a company to save a lot of money and overhead by purchasing their web services from Amazon or Microsoft. They don't have to worry about maintaining their own. All that service space, all that processing power available on demand. It becomes a requirement considering it was so much cheaper than the alternatives. The current internet basically runs on these web services, especially for things that are complex, difficult or intensive. As for web hosting specifically, there are a few major players. Yes, there are plenty of options. And yeah, many service providers don't want to dictate what is and isn't available. But it's not uncommon for deplatforming attempts to target web hosting companies to take down a certain site. A lot of controversial websites that are emblematic of the old internet are no longer with us due to the increasing consolidation of the web and deplatforming, both legal and corporate. LiveLeak is one such controversial example. If you don't know, this was a site that hosted a lot of controversial videos, most often gore, including war videos, industrial accidents, and executions. I cannot say that many or even most of the uses for this site were done with pure intent. For some users, it was their way of seeing terrible things happen, some quenching a sick appetite in doing so. But there is undoubtedly the journalistic element to the site. 
It hosted many politically controversial videos that would have otherwise been banned. During the War on Terror, it hosted many videos that provided an extremely raw, genuine look behind the scenes of what was happening, unmasking the jingoism of the time. It's one thing to say that such things shouldn't be seen by children and most adults, but it's another to say that nobody should be allowed to see such things at all. And who has the right to decide? Who is qualified to determine what adults should and shouldn't be allowed to see? Another similarly controversial site is Kiwi Farms. It has been subject to numerous targeted deplatforming campaigns, getting kicked off services like Cloudflare, being delisted from Google. Kiwi Farms is essentially a drama website, a forum which focuses on lol cows, people with an internet presence who are meticulously documented by the users of Kiwi Farms, usually for the sake of entertainment or lols, hence lol cows, as they are figures often being milked for lols. Now, the site is most controversial for its link to harassment and doxing, that is, collecting info about people's lives. Now, I certainly can't defend every aspect of this site or how it's used. I can't condone the behaviors of its user base. It isn't what I would do or what I would allow a community I was in charge of to do, but Many of these deplatforming campaigns, which claim to be altruistically about banishing online hate, very often have ulterior motives. Many of the calls to deplatform the site have been led by people who have incredibly compromising information regarding their gross misdeeds being documented on that site. For example, if Say you scam your fans for money, claiming it's for your safety after a harassment campaign, but then use that money to buy cocaine, you might not want people to know that. So you may want to lead a campaign against the site, saying it's because they're harassing you. In truth, the site has undoubtedly brought to light some depraved things that some very bad people have done, and it's one of the only places to record this. My point ultimately being that this attitude is emblematic of the old internet, if the site were to disappear, there may be less total harassment on the internet, unlikely in my opinion, but something would be lost. Another site that has been a victim of the corporate internet, the censored internet, has been the Internet Archive. This one is a lot less controversial than the previous examples, in every aspect except perhaps legally. The Internet Archive is exactly what it describes itself as, a library of digital content used to preserve internet history, much like a regular archive may preserve regular history. You may know it for the Wayback Machine, which stores snapshots of websites over many years. This website, by its nature, gets into all sorts of copyright-related legal issues. For example, they had a recent court case brought on by four book publishers. This means they can no longer scan books and lend them out like a library does. Internet Archive is a site which fights basically daily to stay up, and I think it's doubtlessly doing good for society. The current environment is not the same as it was when the laws governing the internet were written. The DMCA and Section 230 were written during the time of an emerging market, before social media was a thing. It was made for a competitive market, where there were many different entities vying for market share. Any company could pull ahead. A brand new company could take over the web with their brand new idea in a matter of months. Anything could happen. Nothing was certain. Section 230 recognizes websites as platforms rather than publishers. This was done to preserve innovation. They are not liable for content posted on their sites. The issue though is that they behave like publishers. Sites like YouTube have an extensive list of rules you need to abide by to even have your content posted on the website. They can take down virtually any video or channel on a whim, according to their own policies and preferences. They act like a publisher, making editorial changes to the content posted to their site. But they are not liable like a publisher would be. They rely on the labor of others who produce content in a genre, web video, which they have an effective monopoly on. Classically, we talk about media control, the dangers of having a highly concentrated press who only repeat one line of thinking from a highly biased position. If you control the papers, you have a strong degree of influence. Social media is like if a small number of corporations owned all of the news agents, newsstands, where people get their news from. They don't control the news, they control what news can even be shown. And let's say hypothetically these news agents were the only place where you could discuss the news you see. Now of course you can get news outside of social media, but for a huge proportion of people, they don't. And you can also discuss news with people you know in real life. But using social media allows you to reach so many more people by several orders of magnitude. 
And the decisions of these sites are arbitrary. Some people trust big tech to have a kind of fair standard for the kind of content they host and promote and conversely demonetize and delete. But I can't find myself agreeing with that sentiment. I think I see too many examples to the contrary, like one of the Reddit moderators spares editing comments in the back end that disagreed with him and made fun of him. Just a little thought exercise. Actually listen to some of these big tech people, then listen to the user base of their site. You'll almost see the sites, at least in part, reflecting their creators. This is especially so for Twitter. They're kind of like these maniacs who reprogram the human condition in their image. Look at how the psychology of the average Twitter cell changed before and after Musk's takeover. And that's the crux of it. The current big tech lineup essentially controls the culture. Everybody watches YouTube. In fact, I may go out on a daring assumption and suggest that you, yes you, the viewer, watch YouTube. This is the part where I go from how we destroyed the internet to how the internet destroyed us. A massive proportion of our society talks to their loved ones through the internet. Meet their friends their love, their co-workers through the web. It is almost impossible to get around today without the internet. It locks you out of most jobs if you're not using it. And sorry to get all political, but it decides who wins elections. People were saying Obama's use of the internet helped him win back in 2008. Since then, the internet has only pushed even further. It is now truly global, as was originally promised. Over 60% of the world's population uses the internet. In 2008, 74% of Americans accessed the internet. Now it's over 90%. Also, I say Americans because ultimately that is what is relevant. These are American companies. Section 230 is US law. This small number of American corporations basically control the world's new supply, at least the online world, which is the majority of the world. You can say that people shouldn't be getting their news from Twitter or Facebook, but it's an unfortunate fact that, well, people do get their news from Twitter and Facebook. I'd even go so far as to say that removing a candidate from social media constitutes election interference. It automatically locks the candidate off from meaningfully reaching a huge proportion of the voting public. It's favoritism, and a private company does not deserve the right to make that decision. Broadly, there's an idea that the internet would make people smarter. A key aspect of modernism is the idea of progress. There is a spirit of progress, some perfect state that the world is continuously driving towards. After all, all the knowledge of the world in the hands of anyone to access at any time, thanks to the propagation of information, thanks to the internet and global communication, we know better what is true and what is false. <laughs> The world before the internet was probably full of cognitive dissonance. There's nothing outside of the internet that's worth it to me. Now, the internet is certainly good at propagating information. Here's the issue. Not all of that information is true. I think basically everyone acknowledges this. Fairly widespread studies have indeed shown that misinformation spreads faster than real information. In part because sensational things, especially things that confirm somebody's pre-existing beliefs, are more likely to provoke an emotional response and get shared. It's important to note that this spread of misinfo is not unique to any political faction. It's a universal. Now, of course, many big tech companies have taken measures to combat misinformation. I think the majority of these measures that have been taken to combat misinformation have not actually been effective in achieving that goal and have actually been harmful in unintended ways. Again, big tech companies control who has access to the audience. Anybody can come along and make their own site but none will ever be able to reach the giant audience. When we rely on American tech companies to police people's thoughts for us, they're never going to be unbiased. There is no objective observer, some perfect judge at these companies. The fact checkers, the moderators enforcing the content guidelines, they're all inevitably going to be biased and doubtlessly have blind spots to misinformation that supports their existing beliefs and values and the presuppositions they hold to. I will say Twitter's current community notes is one of the best implementations I've seen of it. It requires approval from people of opposing political identities before a note is applied to an exit and they're required to actually address the claims in writing and provide sources supporting the claims made in the notes. Note. They're so much better than the boilerplate disclaimers that bots apply on posts on other social media sites. 
Community Notes has resulted in many of the best moments and are one of the greatest features ever introduced to social media. They should be mandatory on every social media site. The other knowledge issue with social media is the imbalance. I'm sure the internet has made a number of people much smarter than they would have been before. So much access to so much valuable information and it's so easy. But I think the number of people this actually applies to is very slim. I think the very few people are actually maximizing their potential in terms of building knowledge on the internet. That's not how most people use the internet. The internet is so full of information, but very little of it is actually meaningful. And so much of it is mindless entertainment. And even then, it's not even that entertaining. There are more distractions than ever before. And I think that simplistic entertainment comprises a much larger proportion of information available to an average user and a much larger proportion of what is shown to them. There are so many distractions available now to the average user that I think in some ways people may be becoming even less educated. While a few use the internet to its maximum potential, most I'd argue are actually learning less than they otherwise would have. They're using algorithms that place them in their own world. They're less likely to come across information that doesn't conform to their existing beliefs. This imbalance will affect society in the future for a very long time. The internet is destroying attention spans. This hurts people's ability to focus and retain information. Short form content is easier to consume. Content with more visuals, which move faster, are more compelling, inherently. It's harder to use the internet without being distracted because so much research has gone into distracting you. So much time and money and expertise. This knowledge imbalance will be an important aspect of future class divide. It's also a small number of people who are concerned with data privacy. I think everyone knows that big tech takes our data, a lot of it. People largely are against this data collection and do tend to value their privacy. But more than ever, people seem willing to allow these intrusions into your life. This collection of private data. It's not so much that people don't recognize the issue with modern surveillance, it's that we're numb to it. Studies have revealed that the average person finds it hard to avoid surveillance in public. Everybody is walking around with a phone in their pocket and can record at any time. That has changed our social dynamic, how we engage with people. In the past, moments of your life would live on only in memory. Now they can be recorded and live forever, and it's easier than ever before to do that. I don't think this is good for societal trust. In the past, the office cubicle was seen as a sign of oppression, conformity. Think the matrix office space. Of course, the open office is widespread. What has actually changed though? You still have to do the same work in the same conditions. Now you have no privacy. You have co-workers looking over your shoulder who you're being compared to in every moment. I think there is a lack of privacy in today's world. And the internet, I think, is no small part of that. It has acclimated people to constant observation. Ironically though, despite having less privacy than ever before, people are more closed off than before. Less forthcoming with one another regarding information. The internet has destroyed socialization. This is an oft-discussed topic, although I don't think discussed with the correct level of depth often enough. The number of people who report being alone has risen dramatically. The number of people who report no close friends, not speaking to friends on a regular basis, not dating at all. I think this is a part of a much larger trend of social atomization that has been unfolding over many decades now, but has really come to a head recently. Atomization, simply understood, is feeling alone, even when you're surrounded by people. In chemistry, atomization is a process that involves breaking the bonds in a substance. This imagery is reflected in the idea of atomization that appears in literature which focuses on our society. Failure to form bonds with those around you. It has been exacerbated by recent events, such as the complete societal shutdown over the COVID pandemic and of course, the advent of social media. The decline of many social institutions has contributed as well. Religious institutions, clubs, societies, the replacement of many activities that would be done in public with activities that are done in private or online. But of course, this video focuses on the internet, which has been no small part in this trend. The terrible thing about internet socialization is that it offers just enough of the real thing. You're still talking to people, discussing things, your interests, your ideas. 
but simply does not offer the same level of depth as can be gained by communicating with a real person. Of course, the data shows that people register speaking online and talking in person differently. You experience them differently. Emotionally, there is so much more you gain from having real friends. And that's not to mention people having a parasocial relationship with their favorite e-celeb. That is, feeling a connection to an online figure as if they were a friend. Of course, celebrity worship has always existed, but the internet has only allowed these problems to be inflamed, as the nature of social media content creation means that creators, YouTubers and such, are very specialized, very much in a niche which in many situations you see now allows them to have an unhealthy, strong emotional bond with their audience that traditional celebrities, say, on the big screen wouldn't have been able to have. The thing about this online socialization is that it is a fictional world that provides just enough to its users that they feel dependent, attached, unable to remove themselves from it, but it does not provide the full depth of experience that a real life relationship with another person provides. The online one is easier, and people will tend towards the point of least resistance the easiest option. And even then, if you try to escape that pit yourself, it's how everybody else lives as well. Everybody else uses social media to some extent, especially for people below a certain age. There isn't really much of a phone-free, internet-free world. Certainly not like there used to be. You really have to go way out of the city. In the past, people spoke in person because they had to speak in person. If you wanted to do anything, you had to leave the house. Nowadays, you see stories of people who are afraid to even order food in person. There are stories of people who have to write a script before they get on the phone to order food, who pay a reasonable chunk to Uber Eats on top of what they pay to get food delivered to their door without even having to leave the house and speak to another human. You can say this generation is pathetic, Perhaps it is, but I think any group of humans from any time in history would have ended up the same under these conditions. I can't say that it's entirely negative. Many people nowadays do have an experience of meeting people online who they go on to build a real life bond with later. Also with the internet, everybody can join a community for any niche interest, but maybe some interests like, I don't know, liking little kids shouldn't have a dedicated community people fall into echo chambers which are damaging to themselves and others the further they fall in the more difficult it is to leave to entertain an idea out of the purview of what they believe and everybody is susceptible to this yes even you as the old parable goes in the past you could say you want to fuck toasters and you'd be told you're an idiot now, if you want to fuck toasters, you can go online to the toaster fuckers community and get a bunch of people together talking about how hot it is to fuck toasters. The social issue has extended to dating as well. Again, criticism of dating apps is widespread. It has been covered broadly and it largely extends from the previous issue of social atomization. People struggling to form relationships with all its various causes and effects extends very much into the domain of romantic relationships. There's probably a lot more to say on this that would warrant its own video. It's not uncommon for both men and women to report a negative experience with dating apps, usually for different reasons. If you ask most men why they'd have a negative experience with it, it's often because it can be a wasteland where you struggle to find any meaningful relationships. The average woman using dating apps might report a negative experience because of basically all the terrible people she would encounter within a short period of time. It's shown to have negative mental health effects all around. It commodifies romance. It makes you feel like a product because essentially you are. It tries to push you to pay at every turn and yet we still use them. They're more popular than ever before. In 1995, the most common way for couples to meet was through friends. Online dating only comprised 2% of couples. Remember, online dating was considered a thing for losers. Now, it's the most common way for couples to meet. Maybe nowadays, everyone is a loser. Think about that. It's a method that so many of us report to be a generally terrible experience that we know has negative mental health effects. And yet, it's the primary method for meeting nowadays. Perhaps people wouldn't be doing it at the same rate if they felt they had a reasonable choice to meet people in real life. This is not good for future generations. This is not good for the current generation. This quote from a Stanford article published in 2019 really gets me. I was surprised how much online dating has displaced 
the help of friends in meeting a romantic partner. Our previous thinking was that the role of friends in the dating world would never be displaced, but it seems like online dating is displacing it. That's an important development in people's relationship with technology. We also see how social media content affects a degree of social control in how it has changed language. Social media trends affect the broader culture, obviously, and corporations can control and manipulate social media trends with a level of control unprecedented by any form of media before in history. A good example of this is how we refer to controversial terms through an extra soft, politically correct lens. You no longer refer to suicide. It's called unaliving or game ending. Here's a rule. You don't get to discuss suicide in any serious capacity if you can't even refer to it without using baby talk. These terms emerge because of the policy of social media giants. YouTubers, TikTokers, etc. will get demonetized or their videos taken down if they touch on anything controversial. There are other terms like sexual assault which becomes simply SA or pornography being referred to as PRON. Here's the thing, these topics need to be discussed. At some level we cannot just ignore serious issues entirely, but if we do discuss them, it shouldn't have to be through the lens of some coded baby language talk, because even from the beginning that frames the debate in a different way. When you use words that refer to disgusting things, perhaps it's right that they should evoke some feeling of disgust in the person hearing them. We need to be able to refer to the issues directly. When we talk about this social control, it's also important to touch upon what might be polarizing to discuss, and that is the political effect of social media. Obviously, it's been bad. There's a meme going around about how the young generation Z, the Zoomers, are constantly adopting a new identity. Specifically, a new political identity, one which changes with the weather because of course it does. Kids don't know anything. But I'm sure your brand new, radical, world-changing, rock-solid beliefs are built upon a solid rock, a strong foundation. Completely unlike the poorly conceived political identity you were certain about five minutes ago. The closest thing to an antagonist in the works of Plato are the sophists like Protagoras, for example. To quote Plato, a sophist is he who presides over the art which makes men eloquent. But the sophists were not concerned with the nature of truth. Their primary focus was rhetoric, being able to speak well and be convincing, rather than genuine rigor, an honest and charitable search for the truth. The term is used in the modern day in a similar manner. Why might someone be this way? Perhaps they hold strongly to an ideology and are convinced that it is their duty to propagate it by any means necessary. In this case, debate and rhetoric. A less charitable view is that you can make money doing it. It goes without saying that the internet lends itself so naturally to this character type. Again, it's nothing new. Sophists have existed for thousands of years. But we see a pattern. The internet is like a mirror, exacerbating some of the worst tendencies of humanity. There is an ever-changing political zeitgeist on the internet which changes to something different every couple of years, at least in the English-speaking social media world. The new atheism trend is an obvious example from around 2010. In the middle of the last decade, we saw a trend you could characterize as alt-right or anti-SJW. Around 2020, we really witnessed the concentration of the woke or bread tube trend. Here's what they always have in common. They're always a frenzy. The people who make the most provocative statements always rise to the top. The people who are most emotionally invested, who are invested the deepest, act as though they are in an existential battle for the future of the world. And they heavily reward rhetoric. People who engage in these trends, regardless of the time, it seems, want simple intellectual McDonald's. They want scathing takedowns of their perceived enemies, intellectual destruction. Anybody who isn't on your side is the enemy. It's only natural that the people engage in whatever community it is at any given time hyperfixate on debates because it's seen as a kind of intellectual proving ground, and a live debate can greatly reward rhetoric. If a point sounds convincing enough and it's said confidently enough, it becomes the truth, at least in the internet's eyes. Not to mention most of these people aren't ever going to actually read any literature on the topic they're obsessed over. They want to feel smart by being better than others, not put in actual work. Sophistry is ultimately about the appearance of intelligence. Looking back at the new atheist era, it was known as a hitch slap. 
where Christopher Hitchens would destroy his theist opponents with facts and logic. But when you observe some of his most popular arguments from this era, it's a little less convincing. For a movement that prided itself on logic and rationality, it really was driven by pure emotion. For example, since it is inconceivable that all religions can be right, the most reasonable conclusion is that they are all wrong. Variations of this argument have been repeated countless times, for example in Ricky Gervais's show where he wins an argument with himself in the shower, represented by him destroying his fake person he created with facts and logic. It's presented as something like, there are thousands of gods you don't believe in, I just believe in one less than you. This argument is very weak though, think about it. There are many different competing theories to explain dark matter. They can't all be right, so therefore they must all be wrong. That just doesn't follow. The existence of competing claims has no bearing on the truth of a claim you're making. Alternatively, 1 plus 1 does not equal 1, 1 plus 1 does not equal 3, therefore 1 plus 1 does not equal anything. It doesn't have an answer. The existence of competing ideas, or objections to an idea, does not affect the validity of a given idea. Becoming popular during this time was about becoming rhetorically fierce. The people who rose to the top were those who could best create the appearance of intelligence, while being able to deeply emotionally affect people. Confidence is extremely important as well. Remember, the con in con man comes from confidence. The following trend was the anti-SJW trend, and this format was carried over under new names. A popular type of video you'd see was the bluehead college SJW getting triggered by facts and logic. Ben Shapiro and Steven Crowder were among the most prominent figures to rise to popularity in this time. One thing you'll notice with this, as with the previous trend, was the targeting of the uninformed who would act as fodder. With the atheist trend, they had something called street epistemology, where you'd ask random people on the street why they believe what they believe, and shockingly, random people on the street have no fucking clue. It was the same with these videos. They'd target someone uninformed as fodder, for some cheap gotcha ownage video that would reinforce the viewer's pre-existing beliefs and provide nothing new. Because broadly, these movements weren't about learning, Ben Shapiro is, yet again, somebody who gets by on creating the appearance of intelligence, on being rhetorically very sharp, focusing very singularly on the art of the debate. Of course, he had his famous moments, like the just sell their houses and move, when asked about people's houses going underwater due to climate change. And the woke trend carries most of the same hallmarks. Endless waves of similar low-quality fodder, like racist Karen gets destroyed, Complete slop, which is basically all about taking down the chuds and the alt-right. I think those inane Twitter posts that always get like 100,000 likes is a perfect example. Old Twitter was, in and of itself, the perfect encapsulation of this. In that year, the website was basically dedicated to these short, pithy, thought-terminating chud takedowns that would always get like 100k likes. There was the same spot the idiot type of content. I think all gas no breaks was a good example of that. Cherry picks a moron who can't defend his beliefs. Propagate those videos everywhere and use it as representative of everybody who believes that thing. It's worth noting that this format preceded the internet and very much occurs today. Whether it's about how stupid Gen Z or liberals or Americans are, it's all the same slop. The debate is also held in high regard and being rhetorically fierce is valued above all, above being academically rigorous. There wasn't any figure from this era that achieved quite the success and broad cultural penetration of some of the previous figures I've mentioned, like Shapiro and Christopher Hitchens. Perhaps Hassan Piker is the most notable figure of this trend, but I don't think he's even capable of the appearance of intelligence. Another thing that all these trends had in common is that while people acted very seriously about them, this content was all ultimately recognized as entertainment. This is the issue that is most unique to the internet. Political debates become mindless entertainment, mindless slop for consumption. Debates should be boring, and they are not always the best form of dialectic of establishing the truth out of two conflicting ideas. They're best suited to certain scenarios, and the vast majority of internet debates really are counterproductive. They make you stupider. My advice would be to avoid this bullshit. Only watch it if you know the debates between two people who you know to be highly informed. If you want mindless entertainment, don't do politics. If you want politics, don't be in it for mindless entertainment. With the advent of each of these trends, there would always be some people, YouTubers slash e-celebs in particular, moving from the one fad to the next, no matter how much it conflicted with their previous views. 
Of course, it was a completely natural development in their understanding. It just so happened that their intellectual development conveniently aligned with what was popular in the zeitgeist at the time, with whatever the dominant view was that was promoted by social media. Now, it's perfectly normal to change, to come to new ideas. I think your views should evolve with time. If they aren't, it means you aren't coming across new information. But for a view to make a rapid shift to the complete opposite direction, lining up with whatever the algorithm is feeding you at any given point. Some may have had a change of mind. Some may be adjusting their public views in an effort to maintain relevance and make money. Many just adopt the newest craze because it's popular. The algorithm brain. The people who just absorb whatever personality the algorithm feeds them. You know, let's listen to Molchat Doma and Plastic Love while talking about biblically accurate angels, walkable cities, and analog horror. This is harmless when it comes to the media you consume. It's not so great when it applies to political beliefs. A few years ago, the algorithm was recruiting people to the alt-right. But then, of course, these people, they discovered online figures that challenged those beliefs. So those same people became a radical socialist. It just so happened to coincide with the algorithm changing, with the popular content on YouTube changing. To me, saying you escaped the alt-right rabbit hole just to embrace another extreme fringe position isn't a sign of intellectual strength. To me, it's a self-report that you will consume whatever ideas the algorithm feeds you. I look at the amazing atheist as a hilarious example. He was a ranting atheist, then a proud Gamergate anti-SJW, and now he's trying to be a bread tuber. The only way he's been consistent is how consistently terrible he is as a person. Politics has always been touchy. It's always been very hot-blooded and inherently divisive. The internet has not improved this. It has only further exacerbated extremes. It essentially pits people against each other. The issue we see with the internet broadly is that it amplified problems that humanity already faced. Culturally, when we explore the ways in which technological development may harm us, we conceive of it as some outside force with a mind of its own. Terminator is a classic example, a computer which gains sentience and turns against humanity. But in reality, the worst developments are those that make it easier to turn against ourselves, to self-destruct. The internet has taken over our lives. You see, we are going to be more reliant on this technology as the years go by. It will only grow more complex as our ravenous demand for more keeps marching on. More complex systems will beget incredible new things, certainly but it will also need to be maintained. And the overhead for maintaining this system, which is increasing both in size and in complexity, will grow rapidly over time. It will only become more and more difficult to maintain. The number of people capable of maintaining it will dwindle over the long term. All the while, it will continue to transform our society in brand new, unexpected ways. So much knowledge will be under the control of so few entities. So much has been lost already, and we stand to lose more. The entire internet was a Faustian bargain. We stood to gain so much, but only time will reveal just how much has been lost. It's possible, too, that that which we do have can be taken from us, and we will be left with nothing. I would like to thank my current active patrons, Will Matty, Lazy the Crazy, Glorious Bees, Maritime Steak 85, Delirious Fool, Topkeck Red, and Adam Safranco. 